Hello, everybody. This is Dr. Phil from MedPathway.com, your online MCAT test prep center developed by med school professors. Today, we're going to look at lab techniques, including protein purification and separation techniques. We're not going to look at spectroscopy methods that you commonly find in organic chemistry, such as UV and NMR. We're going to take a look at those at a later time. So we're gonna do a couple of workshop passages. We'll look at purification of hypoxia inducible factor, the 2019 Nobel Prize in medicine. And we're also gonna look at mitochondrial permeability and separation chemistry. But we're gonna describe many different types of lab techniques that bridge the biological sciences as well as the chemical sciences on the MCAT. And many of these techniques will be used in additional passages that we'll analyze as we move forward with the workshops. So the simplest place to start was this gel electrophoresis of proteins. And this is commonly done in acrylamide gels, as you see here. So you have a cathode and an anode, there's a buffer. And what you do is you have a power supply. And what will happen is that the proteins will be electrophoresed through the actual gel matrix. Now it's most common that people use sodium dodecyl sulfate or SDS. And what's known as SDS page for polyacrylamide gel electrophoresis. And what you see down here is that the molecule SDS is quite hydrophobic. It's got a bunch of methylene groups and a negative sulfur at the tail of it. And what this serves to do is denature proteins by having one SDS molecule bind for two amino acids. And what this does is it normalizes the charge to mass ratio. And as you put the protein with SDS in the electrophoretic field here, what happens is that you actually migrate and you can see lane number one has a retarded mobility, is a higher molecular weight, and number two has a faster or lower molecular weight, faster electrophoretic mobility of this as it migrates towards the cathode. This normalizes the charge to mass ratio in proteins. Many of the techniques that we're gonna encounter use antibodies. They're highly important in clinical applications. You've probably been following the coronavirus story, how people are describing the use of monoclonal antibodies, the assay for antibodies in people's blood. So what you see here is the typical Y structure of an antibody, also known as the Porter-Edelman structure. They won the Nobel Prize for determining the structure in the late 60s. What you see here is that the antibody or an aminoglobulin actually is composed of two heavy chains and two light chains where the light chains are shown in blue. And so what does this mean? It means that, the, that antibodies are hetero dimers and they're linked together by these green disulfide bridges here and so what we can do is we can oxidize the sulfurs to create disulfide bridges and we can reduce them and when we reduce them we dissociate the actual chains so the variable region is composed of the light chain as well as part of the heavy chain and they reside in what's known as the antibody uh fragment antigen binding excuse me the fab fragment and the constant region, which determines the effector function of an antibody, is known as the fragment crystallizable. So these two arrows here point to the actual antigen binding sites. And so each antibody or immunoglobulin has two antigen binding sites. So it's considered to be bivalent. This is going to be very important to understand how antibodies work because we're going to see a numerous applications with respect to them. So you can also do, in addition to reducing gels, you can do native gels as well. And so what we see here are two different methodologies for gel electrophoresis. So let's take an immunoglobulin, what you see here, and in a native gel, you just run it intact without SDS. And so what happens is that in the sample, what you see is the intact IgG runs at a very high molecular weight which is indicative of the light chain and the heavy chain being associated by the disulfide covalent linkages. Lane number two is just an arbitrary molecular weight marker. Now, if you reduce the immunoglobulin in the presence of something like beta mercaptoethanol or dithiothreatol, then what happens is that you can dissociate the chains. And then if you run an electrophoretic gel in the presence of SDS, then what you'll see is two bands where one marks the heavy chain and one marks the light chain. So the simplest 
application, probably the most common one you're going to see with respect to immunoglobulins is the Western blot. And so in this case, what we do is we're going to use antibodies to identify proteins in potentially complex mixtures. So here, what we do is we run an SDS page gel. It could be under native conditions. It could be under uh, reduced condition. It depends upon the nature of the application. So you always have to be conscious of that. So what you see here are two lanes that have been ran out, and this looks like a cell extract because of the numerous number of proteins. What you can do is actually transfer those proteins over to a membrane, like a nitrocellulose filter, and then the proteins will be in situ hybridized to the membrane itself. And then what you do is block it with a nonspecific protein, such as BSA or some kind of milk extract. And what you can see is that all these spaces here on the filter are going to be occupied and not available for cross-reactivity with an antibody. You add a primary antibody, and you can see here this primary antibody alpha recognizes this protein in lane one, but not lane two. And then what you can do is wash away any nonspecific binding in step five, and then you add a secondary antibody that's been made such that its variable chain recognizes the constant region of the primary antibody. And in most cases, the secondary antibody is gonna be decorated with some kind of fluorescent marker that can be detected with chemiluminescence or some other thing. In some cases, people actually will leak enzymes to it or they'll even radio label it with iodine. And then what you can do is you detect after a second round of washing. And what you see is that we have a specific target protein in lane one, but not lane two. And so what this shows you is that Western blots can be used to detect peptides or proteins in complex solutions. One of the things you always have to consider are what are the controls that you're going to use in a Western blot. So, you know, each experiment should have a positive control and a negative control, ideally. The negative control should elicit no biological response. And so what you can argue is that lane two would be a good negative control. Perhaps it was a cell line that was deleted in the gene expressing the protein that the primary antibody recognized. The positive control, on the other hand, should always elicit some sort of response. So when you think about Western blots as well as all the other experiments you're going to see on the MCAT, you should always think about positive and negative controls. So another application of antibodies is known as the ELISA assay. It stands for enzyme-linked immunosorbent assay. There are multiple types of ELISAs, you guys. We're just going to look at two different types today. That's the indirect, which you see on the left panel, and then the right panel shows you what's known as the sandwich ELISA. So let's take a look at the indirect ELISA. It's going to be used to determine the concentration of, say, an antibody in solution. For example, if you had a patient and you want to know whether or not they were generating coronavirus antibodies, what you could actually do is an indirect ELISA to assess that. And what you have is like a plate, a plastic dish that's been coated in such a way that you can apply the antigen, in this case, of our example would be the coronavirus spike protein, and the antigen will stick by electrostatic interactions onto the surface of that plastic well. And then what you do is you actually add a solution that you think contains the antibody of interest, and this could be the serum from a potentially infected coronavirus patient. And then what you form is an interaction between the antigen and the antibody, and in an analogous fashion to the Western blot, what we can do is add a secondary antibody in black here that has a label to it, a fluor, radioisotope, et cetera. And then what you do is you analyze a response and you can quantitate this using a standard curve as a reference. So the indirect ELISA determines the concentration of an antibody in solution. Once again, we're always going to think about controls. You can do a control where there's no antigen. If there's no antigen, you should get no response to any of these antibodies. You could add no primary antibody, and you should also see no response as well. So over here on the right, we see the sandwich ELISA. And so what the sandwich ELISA does is it measures the concentration of an antigen in an unknown sample. So what we can do in this case is we take our Petri plate, and we actually – 
add what's known as a capture antibody to the plate. And so you coat the plate with a capture antibody, and then you add a source, could be serum, for example, of an antigen that you wish to ask how much is there in solution. And then what you do is you generate a potential antibody antigen complex, as you see here, and then you wash. And then what you do is you add a second antibody, but notice that this second antibody doesn't react with the first antibody, but rather it recognizes the antigen at a different place or different epitope. And what you do is you make a sandwich. That is the sandwich has the two pieces of bread, which are the two antibodies, and the antigen in between is considered the meat of the sandwich. And so what you do is you use a capture antibody to actually capture the antigen and a secondary second antibody to actually see if there's a binding reaction. And also you should be thinking about controls as well. We can also use antibodies to do immunoprecipitation. And so what you see up here on the first panel is that we know that antibodies are bivalent. And in this case, what you see is through the association of the various antibodies with their antigens in solution, you can generate a lattice that is basically gonna be insoluble. And so these can precipitate out your antigen. And so this process of immunoprecipitation has been exploited by doing what's known as immunoprecipitation reactions. And I'll show you right here. Say for the sake of argument, you have a solution such that you have an antigen A. This is protein A. This is a generic hypothetical protein. And it reacts with protein B or it binds to protein B. So we have an intrinsic complex of A and B in solution. And if we take an antibody directed at A, what we can do is actually make an antibody antigen complex that we can fish out by taking a, a cephalose bead that's hooked up to another antibody that can react with the constant region of the alpha. And what you can do then is spin it down a centrifuge and by virtue of immunoprecipitating A with your alpha antibody, what you can do is you can pull down protein B because A intrinsically reacts with B. And if you heat that up, put it onto a, a gel electrophoresis system, what you can do is then run it out and do a Western blot for protein B. And what you see is that you detect protein B when you immunoprecipitate with antibody alpha. And what that tells you, you guys, is that protein A and protein B are interacting. It's used as a way to discover the interaction of proteins with a target one, such as A. In this case, of course, your negative control would be a random immunoglobulin that you would not expect to react with protein A. And not shown here would be a positive control that would show you a Western blot for protein A to prove that the alpha antibody actually pulled it down. So think about that. We can also do what's known as chromatin immunoprecipitation, commonly called chip assays. What these are designed to do is to exploit the properties of antibody immunoprecipitation, but actually what we're gonna look for are protein sequences, or excuse me, DNA sequences that bind to certain proteins. So let's take a look. What we have is a nucleosome array here. So beads on a string. So, so what we have here is a histone tail. And in this case, this histone tail can be trimethylated on YC9. It's just a modification. It's a specific type of protein that associates with DNA. So what if we wanted to ask, well, what types of DNA sequences does this modification K9-methyl-3 interact with? So what we can do then is we can isolate chromatin and formaldehyde cross-link it. Now, aldehydes are really super reactive. So what they're gonna do is they're gonna cross-link everything that's stuck together, protein to protein, protein to DNA, protein to RNA, RNA, DNA, everything gets frozen. And then what you do is you sonicate and you break it up into various nucleosomes of DNA, as you see here, and that you use an antibody that's specific for the lysine 9 trimethyl group. And so what you do is you immunoprecipitate it as shown here. And then what you can do is you can get rid of the protein with proteases 
you're left with the DNA and you can use PCR to actually amplify those DNA sequences. And once you identify the nature of the sequences, you can be confident if you did your controls right, that this K9-methyl-3 associates with specific types of DNA sequences, that's chip assay or chromatin immunoprecipitation. There's also flow cytometry. Now flow cytometry is used in clinical labs all of the time, as well as research labs. And one way to think about it is to determine which type of cells are in a particular population. One example can be a bone marrow biopsy. So we know that mast cells normally occupy just like two or 3% of bone marrow. But in some cases, some diseases like mastocytosis, for example, it could be as high as 20%. So imagine you had a patient and you wanted to determine the percent of mast cells in their bone marrow because they have some symptoms like angioedema or hives that is indicative possibly of mastocytosis. What you do then is you take antibodies, the green or the black, that are specific for cell surface markers that are specifically expressed on these cell types. What are they? Well, I wouldn't expect you to know these by heart, but rather you should appreciate that CD117 is specifically expressed on mast cells, but CD20 says I am a B cell. And by having this interaction between the antibody and the antigen expressed on the surface, what you can do is create a complex with a floor and by taking the population of cells in the bone marrow, you can pass them over a flow cytometer. As they come down here, a laser light will shine and it'll react and create fluorescence and it can actually count the number of cells you have in solution. So flow cytometry is a great way of identifying the types of cells in a population of cells using antibody antigen complexes. I'll now switch over to nucleic acid techniques, and the classic one is called the Southern Blot. This is after, named after E.M. Southern. He's a, 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 a British gentleman who developed this technique in the 70s. What you should remember is that Southern blotting is designed to detect DNA sequences, either their presence or their absence or their mutation or perturbation in some way. Southern blotting is for DNA. So over here, what we've done is we've separated DNA fragments like a chromosomal uh, digest with restriction enzymes on an agarose gel. So the fragments are separated based upon their size. And we have four lanes. We have a positive control, a negative control, sample A and sample B. These are hypothetical samples. Just like the Western blot, you can run the gel and transfer the nucleic acids over to a nitrocellulose membrane. And in this case, what you do is you denature the DNA strands by treating it with hydroxide, and then you bake it on or you UV crosslink it onto the actual membrane itself. It's stuck in situ. Now, what you need in a southern blot is a DNA probe. This is the DNA sequences of interest that you want to query in these samples. And so what you do is you can label it. In this case, it's labeled green. It's like a fluorescent label, but people often radio label them with P32. And here what you do is you probe it, and this interaction here that lights up is the single-stranded probe and the single-stranded DNA that resides in situ on the nitrocellulose membrane. And so the positive control lights up. That's nice over here. Okay. The negative control is nothing. Remember, no response in a negative control. And over here, sample A looks like the positive control, so we see that sample A is giving us a good hit, but sample B shows a smaller DNA fragment. And one possible explanation of that is that sample B is derived from a source such that there's a deletion or a mutation or something chromosomal translocation, et cetera, in that particular sample. We know that sample B has those DNA sequences, but they've changed for some reason in the sample. So that's a Southern blot, DNA to DNA. Now we come over to the PCR, the polymerase chain reaction. Now we're gonna look at two types of PCR. We're gonna look at a non-quantitative, which is traditional PCR first. So here's what you do. You take a duplex DNA sample. And the beauty of this is that theoretically you can start with one DNA molecule because we're gonna amplify it. We're gonna heat it and denature the strands so the uh, um, 
hydrogen bonds dissociate. We're gonna cool it down. As we cool down in the presence of primers, which are single-stranded uh, 17 to 20 mers that are gonna hybridize to those single-stranded DNAs, we're gonna create a duplex. And then what we can do is we can extend off the three prime hydroxyl and generate amplify DNA. So we've gone from one as the starting and we end up with two and we do a new cycle. This is a very powerful technique for detecting DNA sequences, especially in samples that have very little DNA. This could be old fossils, for example. But one of the problems, you guys, is that it's non-quantitative, okay? So you can't really get a strong quantitative sense for this. But what people have done is created real-time PCR or RT-PCR, and this is quantitative. And let's take a look how it works. Now, most people use quantified PCR, qPCR, RT-PCR, they're synonymous to quantify the amount of messenger RNA in a sample, okay? And this has largely replaced the northern blot. So a southern blot is DNA to DNA. A northern blot uses RNA, okay? You have a DNA probe to measure the amount of RNA in a sample. They're more cumbersome, so people have taken a cell line, they lyse the cells, they extract the poly A amount of RNA, because remember poly A is the fraction of RNA that contains messenger RNA. And then they can use this enzyme known as reverse transcriptase. And what reverse transcriptase has the power to do is to convert RNA into double-stranded DNA. It was originally isolated by Baltimore and Temin to study and discovery of retroviruses. We're gonna see more of this when we talk about virology but reverse transcriptase is a powerful enzyme in virology as well as molecular biology. And so what you do is you start with a single-stranded RNA and you end up with a double-stranded DNA with RT. And what you now have is a substrate to perform your reaction. And what you can do then is just like the PCR we saw before, you add a primer, a single-stranded primer, but you also have a thing called a probe that's in the middle of the gene of interest. And this probe has been designed in a very crafty fashion such that the five prime and three prime ends, as you see here in the yellow and the green, have floors. And if you shine light on the floor while you're doing the polymerization reaction, what happens is that this light, as it gets emitted by fluorescence, gets immediately quenched by the proximity of the three prime floor. But as we know, these polymerases also contain exonuclease activity. And so as it comes through, it cleaves off this floor and then the light that is shined on it is no longer quenched and then you get a fluorescent signal. So every time that Pac-Man polymerase goes through the actual target sequence, it's clipping off the floor and you can detect the fluorescent signal here. And then after a certain number of PCR cycles, you'll detect enough fluorescence to get what's known as a threshold. So one of the things about RT-PCR that's commonly misunderstood is that the more PCR cycles that you do, the less DNA you had in your starting sample. So if, for example, you took 30 cycles to get threshold versus 40 cycles to get threshold, the this, this 40 cycle threshold had less starting material than the 30 cycle threshold. It's kind of counterintuitive. We'll now switch over to more physical techniques and we'll look at some chromatography. And when you think about what chromatography is, you should always think of it as being the separation of substances based upon their physical behavior in both a mobile and a stationary phase. Always need the two phases. The first thing we'll do is an antibody purification column. And I showed you how you can actually generate beads coupled to peptides and proteins when we discussed amino acids last time. Now, our objective in this particular example is to generate and purify antibodies. Imagine for the sake of argument, you wanted to purify a coronavirus spike protein antibody. How would you actually do it? Well, here's how you would do it. What you would do is you'd make a, a recombinant peptide that mimic the coronavirus spike protein. And if you're gonna make an antibody to a peptide or to anything, you want that 
to be really negatively and positively charged. You want a really hydrophilic sequence that's going to be recognized by the immune system quite readily as opposed to hydrophobic sequences. And what you do is you inject the, pan the antigen into uh, the host, as you see here, and then over some time, what happens is that you collect the serum, okay? And the serum will be the mobile phase, we'll see in a moment. And what you recognize is that you have many different types of antibodies in serum. We have lots of immunoglobulins floating around in our blood. But the one that we're interested in is the one, the red one here, that was raised against the actual foreign invading peptide. And so what you do is you collect the serum and you apply it to a column. And this column, this is, the, this is the immobile phase or the stationary phase. This column has been designed such that you've actually taken this peptide that recognizes, or actually it's a sequence of the coronavirus spike protein, and it's been coupled covalently to a bead. And what happens is that you, as you pass these antibodies over the column, only the ones that recognize the sequence should be retained on the column the other one should flow through as you see here. And then what you can do is wash the column. And then the way you get the antibody of interest off the column is you add a solution of a competitor peptide. Because what you recognize you guys is that the antibody antigen uh, complex is perhaps a very high affinity. It's also not gonna be covalent. And so it'll come off, it'll come on, on and off. And if you have a competitor peptide there, what you'll do is you'll eventually swamp out the antibody antigen interaction with a peptide antigen interaction. And then what you'll do is elute the peptide and you can confirm its presence with a Western blot. There's other types of columns too. There's gel filtration chromatography. And in this case, the beads have been engineered such that they have little cavities inside of them. And people have engineered them to have very defined sizes of the cavities such that what you can have happen is that if you have a solution with a high and low molecular weight protein species, so a big and a small, what you can do then is have it such that the small species actually goes inside of the beads and then it goes out. So it's included in the size in the beads, the volume of the beads. But the big one over here, no, it's excluded. It's too big to enter those beads. And so as a consequence, what happens is that the path down the column and out of the column for the high molecular weight species is much faster than the low molecular weight. And what you end up getting is actual proteins being separated as a function of their size. That's gel filtration chromatography. We have ion exchange chromatography. This is very common. And in ion exchange chromatography, what we have is a stationary phase of beads that's actually been uh, constructed so that you have negatively charged anion species attached to it covalently. It's called cation because it's going to bind to positive charges. Uh, so imagine for the sake of argument, we have uh, a solution of three amino acids. We have aspartic acid, histidine, and arginine, and it's at pH five. And so if we look at these at pH five, we see that what we're gonna have is a negatively charged carboxyl groups and an amino group that won't be uh, titrated yet. So that means aspartic acid at pH five has a charge of minus one. Over the histidine, we see that histidine has a charge of plus one, because the imidazole side chain over here hasn't been titrated yet because you recognize that the pKa of imidazole is approximately close to uh, physiological pH, around 6.8-ish. But over here, we see arginine also has a charge of plus one. We see two pluses and a minus on the carboxyl, but we know that this group here, the guanidinium group, will not be titrated until you get to PK 11-ish. So what we do is we take the solution, we put it onto the column, and then since everything has some positive charge, we're gonna get some binding. And so then what we do is when we wanna elute, we elute with an increased pH and salt gradient. And what happens as we raise the salt, we're gonna get interactions that are gonna uh, dissipate the interaction, the plus and the minus on this particular uh, 
nitrogen here on aspartic acid. So aspartic acid will come off first. As we increase the pH, what happens then is we're gonna titrate off the imidazole proton and at some point it'll be uncharged and then we'll kick it off, but the arginine will be charged till we get to a very high pH. And so what we can do is we can actually separate out the amino acids one by one based upon their increasing basicity properties in this gradient, ion exchange chromatography. We also have hydrophobic chromatography. This is based upon the hydrophobic effect and the hydrophobic effect is really important. It actually determines how proteins fold in their three-dimensional structure because we know all the hydrophobic residues like to go to the middle and bunch up together in the core. It also tells us how membranes form, how the bilayers form. And intrinsic to the hydrophobic effect is the concept of entropy or order. And you remember from your basic thermodynamics that delta G, the Gibbs free energy, equals H minus T delta S. So that the larger the delta S, the more negative the delta G, and we know that negative delta Gs are spontaneous. Okay, so intrinsic to the hydrophobic effect is the thermodynamics of entropy and the Gibbs free energy. Let's take a look. Imagine we have two hydrophobic groups over here, and it's like phenylalanine residues. And normally water likes to order itself around these structures. And that's less entropy because entropy is a, a function of disorder. But if I were to add salt to it, what would happen is that the salt would displace those water molecules. And as a consequence, I would create more order and this displacement would make those benzene rings line up together and create the hydrophobic effect or the hydrophobic interaction. So the hydrophobic effect speaks to the ordering of water around macromolecules. Now let's take this principle and apply it to hydrophobic chromatography. Imagine what you wanna do is isolate a hydrophobic molecule. It could be a drug that you synthesize in a lab. And so what we do is we take our, our mobile phase, our beads, and we actually link up hydrophobic groups to them. But in this case, what we do, if we want something to bind to these hydrophobic groups, we actually bind in high salt because high salt is gonna displace the aqueous groups around it such that we get the binding event to occur as I showed you here. And so the binding in high salt displaces solvation and exposes the hydrophobic sequences so they can interact with each other so they can avoid the actual water. And what that does is it creates a lower free energy. So unlike ion exchange chromatography where we saw elution occurring with high salt, Hydrophobic chromatography actually uses high salt to bind. Never forget the hydrophobic effect. We can also purify proteins. And if you guys have seen the double AMC MCAT practice exams, they actually have uh, protein purification protocols as well as the, uh, the, the yield tables on their exam. So let's take a look. Imagine we're growing up some HeLa cells and we isolate the cell pellet, as you see here. We sonicate it to get a lysate. So this lysate has all the proteins that the cell had inside of it. We centrifuge it and get a soluble extract. This pellet here contains insoluble proteins as well as membranes and other junk. We take our extract, so this is the mobile phase, right? And we put it on top of our column here. And it turns out that the thing of interest, this black, circular protein is what's sticking to our cation exchange column. We use our conditions like pH and salt to elute, and here we have a complex mixture of proteins being eluted. So we don't really have our single protein. And what we can do is we can assay for this protein using something like an enzyme assay, uh, a Western blot if you have an antibody, and you can put it through other columns too. For example, if it's a small protein, you can separate it on gel filtration from larger proteins. And so what you do is successive steps and each step is designed to further purify the protein of interest. And so what ultimately happens is that you go through several steps and you create a purification table. Okay, and every purification table is gonna have the step, 
the amount of protein that you measure for like a Bradford assay or some other spectroscopic technique, the number of enzyme units, if you have an enzyme, it's perfectly acceptable to purify a protein that's not an enzyme, but you have to have some way of determining its activity. In terms of enzyme specific activity is enzyme units per milligram, okay? And so you determine specific activity. And what people often do is determine the percent yield in the full purified. You definitely have to know these values here. The percent yield by definition is the number of enzyme units for any given step divided by the enzyme units for the first step, okay? The percent yield in the beginning is always 100. That's because the sample in the beginning, the crude lysate, always has all of the proteins in there, all the protein that you want in there, I should say. And then the full purification is the specific activity of the, of, of the step you're interested in divided by the specific activity of step number one. And you always start out with a full purified of one because you haven't really purified anything yet. You're gonna see purification tables on the double AMC MCAT practice test. It's absolutely high yield for MCAT. Let's switch over to a couple other techniques. This is thin layer chromatography, and this is another physical technique that's designed to exploit the differences in polarity. So TLC is for polarity. So here's what we have. We have a cellulose coated plate. It's actually a hydrophilic surface. And what you do is you pipette a sample, a liquid sample. In this case, it contains two species of molecules at an origin. You let it dry, and then you place it into this tub here, this chamber, and there's a, a solvent, in this case is butanol. And what will happen is that the butanol will make, it'll rise by capillary action, okay? And then what you get then is you get an interaction between the molecules that you put at the origin and the butanol competes with their interaction for the cellulose plate, such that if you're hydrophilic, okay, you're more polar, you're gonna interact more often or more intensely with the cellulose coated plate. But those things that are less polar or more hydrophobic are gonna move with the solvent front by capillary action. And so the idea then of thin layer chromatography is that it exploits polar molecules ability to interact with the surface. And as a consequence, we say polar is lower and slower. And what you can actually do is measure the distance that these species travel. So you have to have a way of detecting these. It can be radio labeled, for example, by determining the retardation factor or RF, which is the distance migrated of the species of interest versus the distance traveled by the solvent front by capillary action. TLC separates based upon polarity. Gas chromatography is a technique used to separate based upon vapor pressure. So here's what we have. We have a stationary phase here. It's like some gel matrix, okay? What you do is you take your sample of interest and you vaporize it, okay? And you inject it into this, into this uh, column here and then you open up the gas control and you have gas blowing through it, okay? So what happens, the gas is pushing your vaporized material through the column, but the more volatile the component is, okay? That means it's gonna spend less time in the stationary phase. So if you have a component that is not very volatile, it can basically condense and interact with the stationary phase, but something that's a gas the entire time is gonna go right through and so what you say is that more volatile components have faster uh, migration through it, or they have lower retention times, where retention refers to the interaction with the stationary phase. That's gas chromatography. And we also have extractions. Extractions are really important because what they do is they tell us about the interactions of molecules with hydrophobic, or hydrophilic layers. And you can think of like a membrane versus a cytoplasm, et cetera. So let's take a look over here. Here's a simple case. What I have is cyclohexane, which is very nonpolar as you see. And over here I have diethylamine. 
which is going to be soluble in an organic nonpolar solvent like carbon tetrachloride, as you see here. But what if I wanted to separate them? What could you do? Well, one thing you can do is you can add hydrochloric acid. And by adding hydrochloric acid, what you do is you actually protonate that amine and you make it positively charged. And therefore, you can drive it into the aqueous phase. So here I have the two separated phases here. Okay. And so what you can do then is separate diethylamine from cyclohexane by changing the pH. And what you can do is measure the amount of each chemical, each, uh, yeah, each chemical in the organic or the aqueous layer by determining a partition coefficient, which is defined as Ki equals the concentration in organic divided by the concentration in water. So extractions are incredibly important. One way to actually get things to move around in layers is to change their pH because you can change their charge. And the more charged the species is, the more in the aqueous layer it shall lie. So we're now going to start our workshops. So everyone knows that they've already registered for medpathway.com. And if you haven't done so, you should too. And so with that in mind, what we're going to do is we're going to absolutely go into the passages.